weekly series of what we call pop-up exhibitions. Uh, what we do every week is we match a presenter with uh, an item or more items in the collection, and we carry these uh, programs throughout each semester, so fall and spring semesters, and we hear many voices, and we intersect the, the holdings of the Magnus Collection with all sorts of uh, perspectives. Um, we are starting the, the, the series this spring with Elizabeth. We, we hear the madness, we say your name, Rinitsky. We don't call you Rinitsky, so we'll, we'll be okay with you. But uh, we have our standards, and, and we, we, we follow them. And uh, it was sort of a, a natural uh, connection to, to have Elizabeth present uh, here today and kick off our spring series, uh, because she's been chasing down, as the title of her book goes to behind the states, uh, the, the, the history of them. She defines as the lost heart of her great grandfather, uh, who perished in, uh, in during the Holocaust, and um, it's it's a book that contains many stories that are very familiar to us working here. There is a story of a visit to uh, to Kazimierz to to to, to uh, Krakow uh, to the book re recently opened Berlin Museum, and really tracking down where the paintings, the remains, the paintings. Where, and one of them is, of course, because of the generosity of the Rinetsky family, it is part of the Magnus collection. And so we are reuniting you. The last time you, this painting was on display was behind glass. And today it's for everybody to sort of not touch, but see <laughs> very up close. It's a 1919 painting. It's, it's signed Warsaw 1919. And, uh, there are many reasons why we think together, even though we, in, we not only share the Bay Area, but we think together along the lines of, of this book and its research, is that we are here uh, taking care of a collection that is made of many fragments. And all of these fragments tell many different stories, and these are stories of people, and sometimes of people who are missing. And uh, we want to know what these stories are. So thank you, and please join me to welcome Elizabeth Rinet. Hello. It's <laughs> you're all spread out, and I hope you all can hear me. Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Okay. Good to go. Thank you for coming. Um, this, as Francesco mentioned, is a really special location for me to speak because. The Magnus actually has one of my great-grandfather's paintings, this piece, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the body of the, the presentation. Um, so I guess I'm going to go ahead and start. So my story begins with a man that I never knew, Moshe Reinecke, or as you say in Polish, Janetsky. He was a prolific Warsaw-based artist who painted the Polish Jewish community in the interwar year period. He perished in the Maidanic concentration camp, um, during the Holocaust, more than 70 years before I was born in San Francisco. He was my great-grandfather, and this is a self-portrait painted um, in 1931. It's actually a piece, I should note, that is not held by my family. It's held by the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, which has 52 of my great-grandfather's pieces. This is a story not so much about Holocaust-era art restitution, but about my efforts to rescue my great-grandfather's legacy and to bring his art to new audiences. It does so as a multi-layered, multimedia project. There's a book, there's a website, and there's a documentary film that is currently in post-production editing. But at the center of the project always has been and always will be my great-grandfather's art. And in order to tell the story, I show you this photograph, and there are a couple important things to know about this photograph. The first is that this is me in the cute lace tights and black Mary Janes. I'm sitting on my mom's lap. To the side here is my dad. And on the other side are my grandparents, my father's parents. And both my dad and his parents are Holocaust survivors. And what is also interesting about this photograph is that on the wall behind us are two paintings. And those are the paintings of my great-grandfather. 
And I show this photograph to introduce you both to the characters in the story, but also to let you know that I literally grew up beneath my great-grandfather's paintings. They were in my home, they were always a part of my life, um, and so I grew up really knowing them very intimately and in a way that was less formal. They weren't in an art gallery, they weren't in a museum, they just, I interacted with them on a daily basis. I'm obviously not a Holocaust survivor. I cannot bear witness. I am, however, really uniquely situated to tell this story. And I share this photo with you, again, not because um, I particularly love the way I look, but again, to show you that there is a photograph of a painting behind me. And the one that is also displayed in the slide is, is that painting. What is really special about having grown up with my great-grandfather's art in my house is that, as I said previously, it's, it's just something I got to know on my own terms. So there was no curator standing in my living room, there was no do docent to guide me through to show me the sorts of things that I should really notice about the art. And what that means is I got to see things that maybe over time grew and changed and made me see things a little differently. And that has helped me tremendously in this journey, this Chasing Portraits journey, because I've come to see and understand the art um, from very different perspectives and have grown alongside with the art to understand it in ways that um, maybe at first were not religious and then as I understood Judaism and, and the history of the Jewish people in Poland a little bit better, began to understand it a little more fully. And so, that has really been a unique way for me to understand this story. I share this collection of photos here for you um, to, to emphasize again that the Magnus has been an important part of my understanding of my great-grandfather's art. You have to understand that growing up with the art, it, you know, it's like anything in your, in your family home. You don't necessarily really appreciate it or value it or understand why it might be important to somebody else. And in late 1981, the Magnus generously held an exhibit um, in what was a new wing of what is now their now defunct museum, because now they're here, but it was a lovely new wing of the museum, and they displayed my great-grandfather's art. And these are photographs from the exhibit. That's me um, <laughs> in my, I don't know, 1970s, or sorry, 1980s suit with the little bow tie. Um, I think I'm 12 or 13. And I'm happy and delighted to be there, but don't really understand um, the, the incredibleness of this moment, that this art has come from Poland and has survived the Second World War and is displayed in this um, fabulous gallery. The painting that you see photographed here is the one that is on this stand here, and I invite you afterwards to come look at it, because up close it's, it's really incredible. You can see rips and tears and creases. On the far right is, is my grandfather, Grandpa George, and what I really wish is that at this exhibit in 1981, I had understood enough to ask my great, my, sorry, my grandfather questions about the art and about my family's history. People will tell you that Holocaust survivors sort of fall under this broad spectrum. Some like to talk a lot about the war and will tell you all their experiences and others just don't really want to talk a lot about it. My family came from sort of the spectrum of not wanting to talk a lot about it. And so my grandfather died in 1992, and when he died, I didn't really know a lot about the art. I knew that my dad and his parents were Holocaust survivors, I knew that the art had survived the war, but the Magnus exhibit was sort of the, the, the touchstone back to my memory that other people thought that the art was important. And that was an interesting starting point for me to understand the art and to, to begin to understand my family's story. The other exciting thing that, well, I mean, my grandfather dying was, was very sad, but the exciting thing that came out of that was we discovered that he had written a memoir of his, um, his Holocaust years experiences. And in that memoir, he talked a lot about his father and the art and between that and the Magnus exhibition that happened in 81, I began to piece together these fragments of the story.
We believe my great-grandfather was born in 1881. He was born in a small town east of Warsaw. The family eventually relocated to a slightly larger town, Shedlitzo, which is also east of Warsaw. He was the 13th of 18 children. Uh, life was difficult, and only five children survived assorted childhood illnesses, three boys and two girls. Moshe had a traditional Jewish education and also attended a Russian middle school. He eventually spent a brief period of time at the Warsaw Academy of Art in 1906-1907 school year. This painting has always really fascinated me. This is a self-portrait of my great-grandfather. Um, but what I think is really fascinating about this painting is the way it's divided, and that is that he is looking right at us, and it's um, a very uh, clear gaze at us. And he's painting himself a little separated from this scene, which I believe to be a wedding scene um, painted in 1918. He was a man that was, in my modern day perspective, somewhat conflicted. He grew up in a religious family, but lived a very secular life. And this rendering this, of this moment seems to me to really document and portray that. He's portrayed a very Jewish religious scene, but has, um, portrayed himself in Western garb, he's wearing a coat and tie, and, and seems to uh, understand that he occupies both spaces. Moshe wasn't really supposed to be an artist. Of course, there is the, um, you know, you're, you're not supposed to paint graven images. And also, the, his father was very practical. He thought that Moshe painting wasn't going to make him enough money to really have a sturdy income and to create a stable family life. And so he, his father, Moshe's father, made a decision about uh, how he could get Moshe to leave the painting behind and to, to just to have it be a hobby. And the brilliant plan was to marry him off. And so he married him off to Perla Mittelbach, and this is Perla. Perla was from a family of some means, um, and they the family together um, helped the, the young couple acquire an art supply store on Krucha Street. And for those of you that know Warsaw well, know that Krucha Street is in not a, uh, a dominant Jewish neighborhood. So they, um, they, they lived a more secular life in this community. And what was great about my understanding of Perla is that she encouraged Moshe to paint. And so she stayed in the store and she sold art supplies and, and other art um, accoutrement that people would want that you would see in this painting while Moshe went out in the world to paint. They had two children, um, Yerge or uh, George, as my grandfather later Americanized his name, is on the left and Bronislava, his daughter, um, is on the right. Um, Bronislava in this picture is about seven years old. My grandfather, George, is about five. Very sadly, Bronislava perished in uh, the Warsaw ghetto in, in the early days of the war. Moshe was a prolific artist in the 1920s and 30s, um, or as some say, as I, I used before, the interwar year period. He had a style that's uniquely his, and although he often painted the same scene, I love to show these four photographs together because although they are so different, we might use the same words to describe them. So um, you might say that these are, are men in Talmudic study, they are um, in some sort of library situation, there are books. There are tables. I love that their bodies are hunched over. Um, I love that they all have these fixtures. These, you know, they're they're all the same to me. Sort of this. Um, I, when I see them, I always say, "That's my great grandfather's paintings." It does have always helped me to recognize his work. Um, but what I also really like about these paintings, and it's really common of my great grandfather's work, is that he painted groups, group scenes of people with not a lot of emphasis on individuality. So um, particularly in this bottom right one, whoops, this bottom right one, you can see that you can see the individual figures but not the individual faces. And to me that's actually really powerful because there's a sense of what the Polish Jewish community was and, and how we think about it without um, a distraction of, of a particular individual. 
My great-grandfather also painted everyday workers, so these lath workers. Um, and what I love about this piece, again, is that it's the sense of community. And so you are looking at the machinery that they're working, that this man is working on, and you can see that he's working, but you don't know much about him. Um, but that's not really important. It's sort of this marriage between the machinery and him and the room itself. And I love, of course, the light that streams in. Which I'm like a hot, I, I wish I could really paint. That is a skill I don't have, the light streaming in. I'm, has anybody tried that? I Anyway, it's to me always fascinating that, that, that looks, it looks like light coming in a room. Moshe didn't paint the rich and famous. He painted everyday workers, the people that he knew well. This, of course, is a photograph by Roman Vishniak, and the Magnus actually has a display of Vishniak's photographs out in the hallway. If you haven't seen them, it's great to take a look at them. Um, what I love about this is that when I first started trying to better understand my great-grandfather's art, I was curious to know what it was that he was painting. And I often thought that he was inventing scenes and being creative in what it was that he was producing. And when I discovered Vishniak's photographs, I suddenly discovered that my great-grandfather and Vishniak were documenting and portraying the same community. So this water carrier from Lublin in 1937 reminds me a lot of this water carrier done in 1930. Did Vishniak and my great-grandfather know one another? Probably not. I mean, I suppose it's theoretically possible. One could call them contemporaries. Um, but what's more important to me than knowing if they knew one another and if they were inspired by one another is to know that they both saw the poetic and the everyday and that in their creative, um, their, each of their artistic styles chose to record the world in the way they saw it and document it, and which, of course, today is incredibly valuable because, of course, it was all destroyed in the Holocaust. On September 1st, 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland. My dad, who's shown in this photograph down on the left, was not quite three. This is a photograph in the bottom left, my dad and his father, George, um, my dad was born in Gdynia. I assume that this is where that photograph was taken, the north on the Baltic Sea. In the early days of the, the invasion, the Polish people tried to dig trenches to slow the advance of the German army. And this is a photograph of a ditch being, um, one of the ditches that they were digging. And one of the things that is so fascinating to me about this photograph is when I first saw it, it reminded me of this painting. My great-grandfather continued to paint in the early days of the Second World War, and sadly, I don't know if this is exactly what he saw. It is just something to me that's reminiscent of it. Um, but it was powerful to see and know that he continued to paint. As the war dug into the trenches of Warsaw, and it became clear that life was about to be very different, um, my great-grandfather became concerned about his body of work. And he had been a prolific artist in the, in the 1920s and 30s. It's believed to, that he produced close to 800 paintings and sculptures and sketches and notebooks um, before the war. And so he made this really fateful decision. He decided that he would take his art and he would divide it and bundle up and he would hide, distribute it and hide it in, in and around the city of Warsaw with people he thought he could trust. And we don't know exactly how the bundles were created. We don't know if they were made um, by medium or size or subject matter or date, but the idea was that they would be distributed. And the other idea was that when the war was over, the bundles would be collected and the collection, of course, would be whole once again. Um, in 1940, the Nazis began construction of the Warsaw Ghetto and ordered all the Jews in Warsaw in and around um, its suburbs herded into the ghetto. And there were something like 400,000 people that eventually ended up inside the Warsaw Ghetto, which was about 1.3 square miles. It, of course, as many of you know, had a wall with a tent that was 10 feet tall and had wire on top and had guarded entrances. It was very difficult to move in and out of the ghetto. 
When I first started to understand and study the war, the idea of 1.3 square miles and 400,000 didn't make a lot of sense to me. I knew it was a lot and it was crowded. I had seen footage and, and descriptions of it, but I tried to contextualize it a little bit. And so that's what I've done here. I've drawn a map that's basically downtown Berkeley. And so from the edge of campus along University, uh, almost down to Shattuck, that's about 1.3 square miles. The population in 2013 in Oakland was a little over 400,000. So that would be all of Oakland in downtown Berkeley, just to give you a sense of, of the massive numbers of people. My great-grandfather willingly went into the Warsaw Ghetto. My dad and his parents stayed out. They had false papers. My grandpa George begged his father not to go in the ghetto um, to no avail. And once he was in the ghetto, my grandpa tried to get his dad and his mother to leave. And he was successful in getting Perla, my great-grandmother, out of the ghetto. But my great-grandfather stayed. He told him in the last phone call that he ever had with him that he wanted to stay with his brothers and sisters, and if it was death, so be it. Um, and very tragically, of course, Moshe eventually was deported to Majdanek, where he perished. Um, Perla survived, and, and my dad and his parents survived, um, living on the Aryan side and through a lot of luck and access to money and resources, uh, survived the war. An interesting note about this painting, so just like the, the painting up here was gifted to the Magnus in 1981, this painting, Refugees from 1939, um, which shows people in the early days of the war trying to to move themselves, right? Refugees bundle their belongings and, and try to go to safer places. Um, this painting was donated to Yad Vashem and today is part of their permanent art collection and a copy of it is on display in their Holocaust Museum. After the war, my dad and his parents eventually ended up in Italy and because I'm tight on time today, I'm gonna gloss over that story. Um, but they, that's where they ended up, um, they were in Italy. Around the same time that my father and his family moved to Italy, the Allied troops moved across Europe, liberating, um, liberating people and discovering, of course, the massive extent of the Nazi looting of cultural artifacts. So after the war, my, um, my dad's family was in Italy, Perla goes back into Warsaw to try to recover the bundles that were hidden. And this is what she, what she sees in Warsaw. And Warsaw, of course, was one of the most devastated cities in all of Europe. It was massively devastated for, th for four reasons. The first, of course, is the initial invasion in 1939. The second is the ghetto uprising in April 1943. Then the Warsaw uprising in August 1944. And then the Russian occupation of the city when the Nazis did leave. So it was into this that Perla goes and looks for the bundles that my great-grandfather hid in the early days of the Second World War. Amazingly, she found a package of art um, in Praga, which is across the Bistua River in a part of the city that was relatively undamaged. According to Grandpa George's memoir, as I told you, there were about 800 paintings and sculptures. Um, and I can't fit 800 frames on a slide. <laughs> So this is 80, and I show it to you to show you the percentage that was recovered, just about 120 paintings or 15% of the original collection. So all these blank frames represent all the paintings that were presumed to have been destroyed and lost in the war. So the bad news is that they thought all these other paintings were lost. Um, the good news is that they were wrong. And so the chasing portrait story really picks up on that moment of discovering that they were wrong and discovering that there were more paintings out in the world. So this is one of my favorite cartoons. It of course shows a man in a Nazi uniform. He is showing this artwork that he has to an appraiser on the Antiques Roadshow, and the, the appraiser says, has it been in the family long? Um, the issue of Holocaust era art looting and restitution um, is a long, winding, and complicated story, but at its very base and core is the simple question, if it's not yours, then you give it back. Um, unfortunately, that's not how 
these issues have gone. Um, they've dragged on for years and years. In 1998, 44 nations met in Washington, D.C. and creating what's, created what's called the Washington Principles with the idea that there was an agreement of how um, ownership of artwork would be understood and discussed and, and sped up for return of, of artwork that was, was inappropriately held by, by wrong parties. Um, and they were non-binding suggestions, so they were not laws and, and they were hard to act on. They, they expected public institutions and museums to uh, generously deal with these issues themselves. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Um, in 2009, they came back together for the Terrorism Declaration to come up with more ideas. This, of course, is not <laughs> my great-grandfather's artwork. This is a Gustav Klimt piece, uh, Del Block Bauer One, And I show it to you to just sort of cue you into the idea of Holocaust-era art restitution. If you saw The Lady in Gold or Monuments Men film, you're very familiar with the stories of art being returned. Um, it's complicated and my book gets into it more, but basically the idea is that art restitution um, is, is a long and complicated process um, involving large sums of money and legal issues. And so my story has a twist in it, and that is rather than being a claimant, I have become a historian. That is trying to track down my great-grandfather's art and to preserve the legacy and to have um, restorative justice in rescuing that legacy and memory. So I want to share a quick story with you that is, takes you a little bit on a journey and gives you a sense of the Chasing Portraits project. So um, in 2004, we were contacted by a man who had these two pieces and he wanted to sell them to us. Um, that's not the story I want to tell you today. That one's actually in the book. This is another one. So when he asked us if we wanted to buy the paintings, we, uh, we didn't know what to pay for them. And so we contacted an art appraiser and they asked, had any ever sold? And we said no. And they said, well, that's kind of funny because it looks like two sold through Sotheby's Arcade in New York for a combined price of $1,700. And we said, well, that's interesting because we never sold any, so who the heck had two paintings and sold them? Um, and the story that I want to tell you that was particularly fascinating to me was in this record um, was the names of the two paintings. So Cafe Scene and the Accordionist. And so I called Sotheby's and I said, do you have photographs of the paintings? And they said, no, Sotheby's Arcade is a lower tier auction house and we don't photograph um, for, for the catalog. And so at Sotheby's, I assumed that, you know, Sotheby's knew what they had. And so I was really surprised to find a number of years later, I got an email from a friend who was doing research in Israel. And she said, do you know this piece? And I said, no, I've never seen that piece. And um, so what's interesting about this piece is it was available in the Tel Aviv Sotheby's catalog and that there was a photograph of it. And so I contacted Sotheby's Tel Aviv and I said, um, what else can you tell me? Who's selling this piece? What do you know? And they said, well, we can't really tell you much because that's all private information. Um, but what is what they were able to tell me is that they actually had the catalog from New York and um, that they actually had photographs. And so these are the pages from that catalog. And what's really interesting is so this is um, the original catalog page and here is the enlarged picture. And this is a their note that, that the two paintings sold for the, the combined price of $1,700. So here are the two black and white pieces, and, and that's amazing in and of itself. I, I don't want to lose track of the fact that even though I don't know who has them and I don't know, um, I haven't had a chance to see them, that now I had photographs of paintings that I didn't know, and that rescue of that memory is really important because it helps to round out and better understand the body of work. Um, but things have a strange way of working out. Um, in 2015, I went to Poland to interview a man who has six of my, my great-grandfather's paintings, and 
somehow in the course of discussion, um, I ended up talking to him about the two that had sold at Sotheby's, and he said, well, I know those two, we sold them. And uh, he said, but I don't recognize them in black and white. And I said, well, I don't have them in color. <laughs> and so he and his wife went digging around the closet, and they amazingly had photographs. And so uh, there are the photographs in color. And I always say this, and people always think I'm crazy, but here I go again. I don't know where these paintings are. The person that has them won't step forward and talk to me. If they look familiar to you, if you know the person that has them, please tell them that I would like to see them in person. It would be really meaningful to me. Uh, the, true, the same would be true for any of my great-grandfather's paintings. What else is interesting about this is the piece in the upper left-hand corner looks really interesting to me. Um, and I went back and looked through my information about art that I had, and I discovered this piece. The Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, as I mentioned, has 52 of my great-grandfather's paintings. And this is, emphasizes to me why it's so important to find more pieces. This is the same scene painted two years apart that you can see my grandfather thinking. He leaves some characters in, he takes others out, he changes the background, he zooms in, he changes the colors. These are, I mean, I'm not educated as an art historian or art curator, but these are the things that teach us about art and insight into how an artist thinks. So I know that um, we're tight on time here, so I'm just gonna wrap up, and the last thing that I, I wanna say is that Similar to what I said at the beginning, there, this project is always about the art, but there are, um, there are some differences between the book and the documentary film. So the book is a narrative nonfiction um, and a memoir. The opening portion of the book relies heavily on my Grandpa George's memoir and historical research that I did in telling the pre-war and the wartime story. And then the story switches to my quest and talks about the museums that I visit, uh, the private collectors that have my great-grandfather's artwork in Canada and Israel and France and the US. And the documentary film is in post-production editing. And I am incredibly grateful. And there's several people here today from the Toby Foundation who has generously, here, where's that slide? The Toby Foundation and the Corret Foundation and the Claims Conference and many, many individuals have given a lot of Time, money, and time for the documentary film. It's um, it's doing well. I'm really excited the, the direction it's headed. Um, I currently am drafting voiceover and we're tweaking components of the storyline. I'm hoping it will be out later this year. That, of course, depends on how editing goes and how um, money holds out, but we're working on that. And so, um, oh, and the last thing is I have books for sale. If anybody wants to buy a book afterwards, I'm happy to, to sell a book and sign it. And so if there are questions, I would be happy to take any questions. Yes. Why did some of these lie? Oh, to be diplomatic. I don't know. I, I, the question was, why did Sotheby's lie? I, you know, maybe the person I talked to just didn't know. Maybe it was in a basement. I, I have found that um, in my journey, it has been better to try to not get angry and to try to build bridges. And so I don't, I don't really know. Uh, but I am grateful that I eventually have found photographs, and I know it hasn't happened yet, but I will someday see those paintings in person. It will happen. So there's a private individual in Poland that has several of my great-grandfather's paintings, and the question was, how did he acquire them? Um, and the answer is smudgy. I, I, don't, I don't really have a solid answer from him about that. Um, the Jewish Historical Institute has 52 paintings, and actually what's interesting about that is originally our guess was that they had a bundle. Um, but we now know they have these index cards which track how they acquired the paintings. 
and a lot of them were acquired immediately after the war, and some were acquired in the 80s. And so we don't, even if we have a name that says how they acquired it, we don't know how those people acquired it. And so those people could have found them, those people could have purchased them. We do know that my great-grandfather actually exhibited and sold artwork in the early days, uh, I mean in the 20s and 30s, and so it's theoretically possible those people bought them. It's just, these are, um, you know, when you've got something like uh, Gustav Klimt's Lady in Gold, you, you know the history really well, and my great-grandfather's, although he was known in Warsaw, he was, uh, his, his paintings were produced in, in uh, Warsaw newspapers and, and Jewish papers, but he just wasn't as well known, so some of that stuff is a little foggier to know. Yeah, Shana. Uh, what, is, uh, what have you learned about uh, you know, his work from the Jewish historical manuscripts? How did they use the artwork at all? And are there any thoughts of the I would love the Jewish Historical Institute to do a big exhibit. Um, I know that they had talked briefly uh, with. Barbara, Barbara Kirsch's like Inglet and Pauline about maybe doing something in that special exhibit space. Um, the curator at uh, the Jewish Historical Institute, as you know, Teresa, um, has expressed a renewed interest since I visited in, in trying to better understand my great grandfather's art. I think what's really important and part of why I think being a historian rather than a claimant is so powerful is that then a place like G opens its doors and says, yes, come photograph them, yes, film them, yes, we'd like to talk with you. And it's hard thousands and thousands of miles away, and I don't speak Polish, their English is excellent, um, but you know, there, there's all these things that make it harder to make those connections. Um, but I think that they, they have displayed some of my great-grandfather's work, and they do um, loan them out to other Polish museums for showing. I'm hoping that the book and when the documentary film is finished would increase the odds that they would do something else and maybe an exhibit dedicated to his, to his works. I mean, 52 is a lot, so it would be interesting.
bridge some of those stories together. Yeah, did, did you have something? No? Yeah, okay. Um, how is that perceptive? Uh, so, to one particular way, grandfather believes that it is, of course, the abandoned world. And the other one, how does your father uh, like what you're doing? Dad, how do you like what I'm doing? <laughs> secret posse that comes to all my events. Actually, you know, that goes back to Francesco's question. I mean, I think that a lot of the film is about my dad and I trying to sort of figure out the story and trying to better understand that history. Um, the other question was, how did my great-grandmother know where to go looking for the art? My understanding is that my great-grandfather made a list of where the paintings were hidden, and if those lists survived the war, I haven't a clue where they are. Um, I think she just sort of remembered where some of them were. Mm -hmm. So, Francesco, are we at time there? It's like it's 12:59. We are. Yeah. Perfect. I'm happy to hang out and answer any other questions. Yes, see the painting.